Hello and welcome to GameSec. This time we're doing something a little different. We're talking about our memories with certain games that they may evoke when we think about these games. Mm -hmm. um, right now, just take a second, go grab some tissues because you might shed a tear or two. Nah, you won't. These are actually pretty funny stories, some good <laughs> stories. Anyway, so we tried to leave the bad ones out because nobody wants to hear bad stuff. So, Oh, there are some bad ones in there. <laughs> and well. Speaking of that, let's start out with my Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild story. This is the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild, and I have the Wii U version because I got this game before I could get a hold of the Switch. First off, I've got to say that this is my favorite Zelda game. In fact, it's one of my favorite games of all time. I didn't think that I'd like it this much, but I really, really do. It's a breath of fresh air that I feel the series needed. I love the open world, the exploration, and hell, I even love the cooking. And I normally hate cooking in games. I also really love going through all of the shrines, trying to figure out how to get out. Oh man, and I loved getting to a new tower, climbing all the way up to the thing and expanding my map. Sure, the weapons break pretty quickly, and like everyone else, I complained about that a lot for a while. But you know what? It really does add to the gameplay. It makes you be more careful and save stronger weapons for when you actually need them. One thing I really like doing is watching creatures like these just camping there. Look at them, there they are, all having a peaceful meal and maybe some friendly conversation. They ain't hurting nobody. Oh well, that doesn't stop me from putting the hurt on them! Link is one cruel bastard in this game, and I'm fine with that. Exploring this game is an amazing experience. The map here is absolutely huge for a video game, but that didn't stop me from trying to keep going. Sadly, of course, it won't let you. You eventually get to buy a house and fix it up, and hell, this game is just full of charm. You've got lots of special powers to manipulate objects in your environment, and it's fun finding creative uses for them. But my story about this game is very humbling, embarrassing, and I don't even know if I really want to tell it. Especially since it only happened not much more than a year ago at the time we're recording this. So, okay, there's this bastard of a boss in the game called Thunderblight. I was having a really, really hard time beating him. I mean, it was extremely frustrating, and I'd try again and again for days and days, and I just could not do it. I wasn't playing the game in my living room, I actually had my Wii U hooked up to my computer here just in case I wanted to record some gameplay footage. And that was my first mistake. I was also very, very close to social media on my desktop computer so I could see how everyone else on the planet had no issues getting past Thunderblight and of course I was the only one having the issues because I suck at games and I'm a horrible human being. Did I mention this was frustrating? So, after several dozen failures, my fist took advantage of the short distance between it and the Wii U. <sighs> That's right, I destroyed my Wii U and the game disc inside. I mean, how dare it not let me win? So, after a bit of yelling at myself for even doing that, I eventually calmed the hell down. I knew what I had to do. That's right, send the Wii U back to Nintendo and have it replaced, which they did for far cheaper than buying a new or even a used Wii U. They didn't replace the game disc or transfer my game saves though, so I had to buy a new copy of Breath of the Wild and start over from the very beginning. Yep, all that progress was gone and I had to do everything all over again. And amazingly, when I eventually got to Thunderblight again, I beat him on my very first try, that stupid bastard, good. And naturally I've beaten the game now and of course seen both endings. Though there's still places on the map that I haven't been to yet. So there you go, now you all know one of my most shameful moments in all of my gaming history. I regret smashing up my Wii U for sure, but the game is good enough to start over fresh. And no, I don't abuse people or animals, just stubborn Nintendo consoles and maybe the occasional controller. Also, now I have a spare Breath of the Wild case, so yay me. God, I love this game. Jackal for the NES is a run and gun style game from Konami. Despite the strange way you use your weapons, it's a really fun game. You control a jeep that's out to rescue POWs that are being held in hostile territories. Your jeep has a machine gun that for some stupid reason can only shoot straight towards the top of the screen. 
You have a secondary weapon which is a grenade that you can launch in any of the eight directions of your control pad. This grenade can be upgraded to missiles by rescuing certain hostages or collecting a hidden star icon. Once you collect your POWs, you take them to a helipad to be airlifted out and then you drive a short bit longer for a boss encounter. Again, this is a very fun game and every time I play it brings back memories of the summer of 1989. I had just spent two weeks on the road helping move my sister and her husband from New York to Colorado. They were getting settled in their new house and we'd go over and visit fairly often to help them work on their new place. My brother-in-law had an NES and he had just bought Jackal. We'd play it every time I was over there for what seemed like hours. Despite all the work that they had to do to get settled in, we'd still manage to play this game. My sister on the other hand didn't like this and would always yell at my brother-in-law to put the video games away and get to work. And he didn't put the video games away until she yelled at him at least three more times. I remember always thinking, what a witch, why do you ever want to marry a girl like that? Growing up with my sister, I always felt his pain as she'd always treat me kinda crappy and tease me like, you know, siblings always do. But I always held my breath though and I never mentioned my thoughts out loud. Still to this day, every now and again I'll throw that memory out to my brother-in-law and we'll have a good laugh at the fun times we had. I know that his NES is still in the family and one of his kids, my nephew, has it. I wonder if he still has that copy of Jackal. This here is Sword of Vermilion on the 16-bit Genesis system from Sega. This is an adventure RPG designed by the same people who made Shenmue. That's right, this game is from Yu Suzuki and his Sega AM2 division. At the time this game came out, Shenmue didn't quite exist just yet, but other great AM2 games like Space Harrier, Afterburner, and Outrun sure as hell did. And believe it or not, this is the first home console game that AM2 ever made. And this game has an unbelievable 5 mega power! You're the son of King Eric. You're out to get revenge and, of course, save the world. You visit towns to gather information and visit shops just like in any other RPG. But traveling to overworld is done with a super cheesy first-person view. Monsters will randomly appear, and to fight them, you're taken to an overhead-like view where the battles take place in real time. Fighting the bosses is cool and weird as it takes place from a side-view perspective. Yu Suzuki really tried to make this one stand out. The music in this game is really, really good, and it's done by Hiroshi Kabaguchi. He's famous for making the music to Outrun, Space Harrier, Afterburner, Fantasy Zone, and of course, Ghost House on the Sega Master System. Can't forget that one because that game is awesome. Anyway, back in 1989, I had asked my family for this game for Christmas. And one day, my grandmother just happened to casually mention that she had picked up my gift. And since her house was easily accessible from my school, I went to her house every day after school while waiting for my mom to get off of work and take me home. At the time, my grandmother would also be at work, so I'd be in her house alone. So of course, I rummaged through everything trying to find the gift that she got me, and I did. I carefully unwrapped it and took it home with me and began playing the game. And after a few days, I snuck it back into the wrapping paper and put it back where she had hidden it. Of course, at Christmas, I opened the game, acted all super surprised and everything, said thanks, and got to resume my game. And of course, she was never the wiser. Sadly, she died back in 2005, but I still have my copy of the game. Unfortunately, I lost the awesome hint book that came with it. However, my story about Sword of Vermilion isn't quite done there, because I also remember the very first time I even beat this game. I had taken my Genesis and several games up to Dave's house and it was my first time I was ever over at his place. I was showing him this game and I didn't even intend to beat it right then, but I did. This helped convince Dave to sell his NES and get a Genesis not too long after. Yes, really. So there's lots of good memories with this game. Sadly, this game isn't remembered fondly by a lot of people, hell is barely even remembered at all. But I really like this one, not just because of the fond memories I have, but also because I find it to be an enjoyable game. Street Fighter 2 Turbo for the Super Nintendo is still a great game. This release in 1993 had some new features from the previous entry that made this game worth picking up. Firstly, you could adjust the fighting speed up to four times in turbo mode. This made fighting really fast paced, which in turn made you pay attention even more to the gameplay. Not that you weren't paying attention before, but with the turbo turned up, you really had to have quick reflexes. Secondly, you were able to fight as boss characters and that was really awesome. 
Fighting a Saget, Bison, Vega, or Balrog really added a lot of depth to the previously small character roster. And if it matters to you, you could choose alternate outfit colors by pressing one of the eight buttons on the controller. This game has a lot of memories for me simply because of all the fun I've had playing it with my friends. Probably the best memory was when three of my friends were over and our girlfriends were with us. In the early evening on a Saturday, we hung out and went to dinner, but when we got back to my place, it was game on. The girls really didn't mind as they were happy just hanging out and talking to each other. At about 11pm, the girls were all sleeping and us boys, <laughs> we were still going strong. As you know, playing any really fun game, time can really fly. And before we knew it, it was 3am. We knew we needed to stop and that our girlfriends were going to be pissed that we played for so long, but we were having so much fun and we just wanted to keep playing. One more hour went by and at 4am we actually decided to stop. But we still had the problem of our girlfriends being mad that we played for so long. We came to the conclusion that we should turn the clock back to make it look like we only played for maybe 4 hours instead of 8 hours. So when we woke our girlfriends up, the clock said it was only 1am and we avoided a thorough verbal assault. But we really didn't give our girlfriends much credit because we forgot that they had watches and they quickly did the math and we got yelled at nonetheless. In the end, it was worth it as it still stands out as one of my favorite Street Fighter memories. And my girlfriend became my wife so she knew what she was getting into when she married me. Here's a quick memory about Arnold Palmer Tournament Golf for the Genesis. I used to play this one with my dad all the time back in the day. Well, this and John Madden football, but mostly this. My dad hates golf in real life with a passion and used to always complain about its existence. But he really enjoyed this one because you could play around in a matter of minutes instead of a matter of hours. And while I was enjoying the amazing 16-bit third-person polygonal power of the Genesis, he was enjoying choosing the best clubs and setting up his next shot. I'd also be jamming to the happening music of the game, but my dad would always get annoyed with it. Fortunately for him, there's an option to turn it off. And when I did, he'd always make sure to thank me. I don't know what his issue was. I mean, the Sega Genesis has way better music than Lyle Lovett or whatever the hell he used to listen to back then. Screw you, Lyle Lovett. Nobody cares about you. But the world will never forget about the sweet 16-bit sounds of the Sega Genesis. That's a promise, you motherfucker. Anyway, we'd always make sure to play through a course or two each Saturday when I saw him after I had quickly checked out the games that I had rented on the way over. It's not the world's best golf game, but it was plenty good enough at the time. And now, Arnold Palmer is dead, and all that's left is this game and some tea. And I'd like to think that his soul is eternally trapped in my cartridge. And I could think of no better resting place for the soul of Arnold Palmer. And neither can you. Yeah, Joe, I didn't know you actually broke a Wii U. I didn't think you'd go that far. I mean, controllers, I've broken plenty of those on games, but I've oh, never yeah. actually, I don't think, hit a system and broke it. <laughs> don't you I, just love that feeling the moment no. after you hit it? You're like, oh, what did I just do? No, oh, I God. do not love that feeling. Yeah, I do not. I recommend it. Control your anger. <laughs> yes. Learn to do that. It saves you a lot of money. And I, I really remember, you know, you telling me that story about setting back the clocks yeah. a long well, time ago. It's fighter. hilarious. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're so stupid. <laughs> and my so wife still brings it up. So stupid. <laughs> it is stupid. Like I'm that. glad what she does. I, yeah. Jeez. <laughs> Just to make me feel bad. Anyway, we've got some more stories, so stick around. I'm guessing that at least 90% of you out there have played Super Mario All-Stars on the Super Nintendo. Or at least have played the half-assed release on the Wii where Nintendo did absolutely nothing to enhance the experience. So I don't need to tell you how awesome this compilation is. You already know that it contains revamped versions of Super Mario Bros. 1, 2, 3, and the Lost Levels. This was such a great release at the time since it made playing through these games even more fun. The 16-bit overhaul in graphics and sound almost brought a tear to my fanboy eye. But I do have one strange memory that I want to share since it is so weird and of course it involves a girl. Back in the mid-1990s, I worked for MetLife Insurance Company. There was this lady that worked in the same unit as I did and we got along really well. And I do mean really well as we'd sneak into the stairwells from time to time just to make out. How we didn't get caught was pretty amazing. Anyway, one fine day this girl decided to let me know that she was married. 
At first, I wasn't really shocked and my immediate reaction was selfish. I continued to make out with her from time to time until my conscience made me realize that, you know what, this is a bad idea. I didn't know how to break it off with her and she wanted to meet at a bar downtown to have some drinks and of course to fool around. I was done at this point and I didn't want that anymore. Alright, by now you're probably thinking, what in the hell does this have to do with Super Mario All-Stars? Well, I'm gonna tell ya. As I said, I had no intention of fooling around anymore with her. Instead of being a man and telling her straight up, I took the path of least confrontation. So when you power up All-Stars and see the silhouettes of all the characters, the background noise sounds like a crowd of talking people. I recorded that sound onto a Sony mini-disc. You know, it could have been a TDK mini-disc, but it doesn't really matter. Anyway, that sound sample is only about 5 seconds long in the game, and I knew I needed a lot more than that, so I just put it on loop for more time. I then called her voicemail at work and then put the phone by my speaker so it sounded like I was in a crowded bar. My message went something like this. Uh, hey, I'm at the bar here looking for you and I don't see you, so I'm just gonna take off, alright? Oh, and I think it's a good idea that we don't see each other anymore, you being married and all. You know, it worked and she actually thought I was at the bar, but in the end she wasn't happy about me ending the affair. Needless to say, working with her after that was very uncomfortable, but it didn't last long as she soon quit. And a special thank you to whoever the crowd is in Super Mario All-Stars. You saved me from being murdered by a jealous husband. Yeah, we've talked about Lords of Thunder on the TurboGrafx Super CD before. It's a fantastic horizontal shooter that does things graphically that you'd never think the system was able to do. And of course, it's also known for its outstanding metal soundtrack. But what's special to me about this game, and my particular copy of it, is that it was one of the last games that I ever bought at Cinderella City. Now, just what in the hell is Cinderella City? Well, it was a really cool mall that opened just south of Denver in 1968 that was at one point the biggest mall west of the Mississippi. I absolutely loved going there with my family. It was divided into four different sections that all connected in a central hub called the Blue Mall. It actually really was like a city with lots of different places to explore. By far, my favorite part of the mall was called Cinder Alley, and that was on a lower level, and it really felt like a seedy alley. On most Saturdays, my dad and I would eat lunch at the Round the Corner restaurant that was down there, and then we'd go to the Cinder Alley Arcade, which was amazing. I played so many arcade games there for the first time, like Space Harrier, Outrun, Hang On, Afterburner, Rastan, you name it. And in a different part of the mall, I think it was in the Blue Mall, was Walden Books, where I bought tons of EGM magazines as well as other game mags. And down another stretch, which I think was called the Gold Mall, was Electronics Boutique where I bought my copy of Lords of Thunder. To be honest, I really didn't buy a lot of video games from here because there was an EB closer to where I actually lived. But I specifically remember that the mall was becoming more and more dead when I bought this one back in late 1993. Shops were starting to leave and eventually the mall finally closed in 1997, just shy of 30 years old. It was torn down and, of course, was replaced with things that are extremely boring. I tell you, I really miss that mall. And now, when I play games like Lords of Thunder, it really takes me back to that place and that time. So this game has an extra dose of nostalgia for me, and I'm glad that it happens to be a really good game, too. Dr. Mario has got to be the second best puzzle game out there right behind Tetris. The simple gameplay of matching up colored vitamin pills to destroy colored viruses might seem like an easy thing to do. I like how the instructions call the pills vitamins. We all know that Mario isn't throwing vitamins. He's throwing antibiotics and probably coding for pain like he has an MD on the end of his name, which we all know he doesn't. Anyway, my favorite memory of this game is playing with a girlfriend back in the mid-1990s. I honestly don't remember where I met Gina Davis, but I do remember the fun times we had. And no, it's not the movie star Gina Davis, but just a coincidence that they shared the same name. There was one day that I was at her apartment just watching some TV with her, and she asked if I'd played Dr. Mario and asked if I'd like to play it with her. I told her that I'd played it and that I would love to show her my skills. She was going to regret this, as I was pretty damn good at this game. And yes, I was good, but she was dynamite. She proceeded to beat me game after game all that night, which of course hurt my masculinity at the time. I went home and knew that I needed to practice up if I was ever going to take her down. 
I did practice, but every time we played in the next couple of weeks, she handed me one loss after another. I'm telling you, I was never able to beat this girl at Dr. Mario, and it was both maddening and awe-inspiring at the same time. I just couldn't believe that she was that good at this game. Needless to say, our relationship didn't last very long. Only about a month, maybe, and it wasn't me who broke it off. I'd like to think that she broke it off for some silly reason, like because I was ugly or smelled like burritos or something. Sadly, I'm pretty sure it was because I couldn't keep up with her at Dr. Mario because I don't smell like burritos and we all know I'm crazy handsome, especially back in the 1990s when I had a full head of hair and it was skinny. Although those memories don't sound that good, I still had a great time hanging out with her and playing Dr. Mario and stuff. <laughs> I definitely have some fond memories of Black Belt on the Sega Master System. As I've mentioned before, this is the western localization of the Hakuto no Ken aka Fist of the North Star game on the Sega Mark III. Punch, kick, and jump your way to victory. It's a really great game and I feel that they improved on it when they brought it over. Anyway, my story about this one concerns a friend that I had when I was living with my dad in Aurora. The next door neighbors were Mormon and they had about 10 kids and I was friends with the one named John. And after a long while of living there, they were eventually called back to the motherland and moved to Utah. Maybe two or three years after they moved, my dad and I went on a road trip to Utah to visit John. I, of course, took my Sega Master System with me. I stayed at his house, and I'm not sure how many brothers and sisters he had at that point, but I'm sure it was more than 10. We played a hell of a lot of Sega during my stay, but the game that we played the most was Black Belt here. All of the kids would gather around the little TV set as we took turns playing, trying to figure out the best way to get past some of the bosses, which can actually be really, really tough. But the entire time we were playing, we were all joking, saying that Ricky, who is the main protagonist of the game, was actually the bad guy. All of these people would just want to come up and say hi or shake his hand or something, and Ricky would just punch and kick them to pieces. We all laughed a lot, taking turns doing the voices for the approaching enemies like, Hey man, how you doing? Oh! Or maybe something like, why are you killing all of my identical twin brothers? What did we ever do to you? It was really fun, and I think about those days sometimes when I play Black Belt. And seriously, everyone should play Black Belt. I also sometimes wonder, whatever happened to John? I probably haven't talked to him in well over 15 years. He was a cool kid. <laughs> Here's Gaia Res on the Genesis released in 1990. More than just your average shooter, this game has a very unique weapon system. Your ship is equipped with a Taz. The Taz is a learning unit and once you shoot it at your enemies it will attach to them and learn their weapon. You can attach it several times to make it more powerful which is really cool. Even with this awesome ability the game is still very hard, like punishingly. At least it keeps you coming back with its amazing graphics. As far as memories go of this game, for me it's a really strange one. Yeah, another strange one. It was 1990 and I still had a Genesis after selling my NES after watching Joe beat Sword of Vermilion. I remember seeing previews of this game in EGM knowing that I had to have it as the graphics looked arcade quality. One day I was driving home from school with this girl who lived close to my house. We weren't together or anything like that, I'd just give her a ride home from school to be nice since, you know, that's just how I am. On the way home, there was a local game shop that I knew had this game in stock. Alright, this is where it gets kinda weird. For some reason that I can't comprehend, I handed this girl the money to buy this game for me and sent her in to pick it up. I don't know what was going through my mind. Why wouldn't I just go buy the game myself? Maybe it's because I couldn't pronounce the title of the game and I didn't want to look foolish and say, yeah, uh, I'll take a copy of that uh, Guy Ares or Gary's or whatever it's called. Or was it because I still wanted to be a Nintendo fanboy and didn't want anyone to see me buying something for a Sega system? Maybe it was a mixture of both, I don't know. But I always remember the look on that girl's face when I told her to go and buy the game for me. She just looked totally bewildered, but after begging her to do it, she agreed and five minutes later came out with that beautiful orange clamshell in her hand. She said she felt like an idiot in there and said the clerk gave her weird looks. I again thanked her for doing that for me since I wasn't strong enough to get it for myself and then we took off her home. And just to think that barely a year from having her buy it, I would go back to that same game store and sell my Genesis and his games to get money for a Super Nintendo.
All right, those are some of our game stories for you. Mm -hmm. Dave, uh, who was that girl that lived close to you that you weren't with? She was, I think, two years under us. So we were seniors. She was a sophomore, mm -hmm. uh, Karen Karen K. Krajewski or something like that. Yeah, but yeah, it was weird. Know. I always get right home and then I'm like, hey, just go buy this game for me. That's <laughs> crazy. Just weird. Just stupidly weird. I don't understand why you did that. But. Anyway, we've got more where this came from, and perhaps, you know, if you guys enjoyed it, we'll do another mm -hmm. one of these. Oh, yeah. And in the meantime, let us know some of your crazy ass game stories. Mm -hmm. And thank you for watching GameSack. Mr. Palmer, I miss you so much. You left the world such great legacy. Tea, video games, and, well, well, tea and video games. I'll drink some tea in your memory. Oh, oh my God, that is awful. God, I'm glad you're dead. Oh my God.